Hi, everybody. Welcome to World Ocean Day. Thank you so much for joining into our webinar. My name is Kelly. I'm an educator at the Bamfield Marine Sciences Center, or BMSC for short. Um, thank you so much for joining because you've now virtually traveled to Barkley Sound to celebrate this event, World Ocean Day, and that's especially useful if you are somebody who doesn't have the ocean right there in your backyard at home. So no better way to celebrate than a virtual visit and we'll take you on a pretty exciting journey to the ocean and even beneath the waves of the ocean a little bit later on. Um, so we are here in the traditional territory of the Huayat First Nation, and we're aboard a BMSC research vessel known as the Stickleback. That's the name of this boat. Uh, behind me is the Pacific Ocean, Trevor Channel, and we'll introduce that area a little bit more in just a moment. For um, those of you who aren't familiar with BMSC, we're actually a shared campus of five different universities. Um, we're also a not-for-profit registered Canadian charity. So the five universities that um, kind of co-manage BMSC are the University of Victoria, UBC, Simon Fraser University, the University of Alberta, and also the University of Calgary. So they are all kind of our, our parents. Now, what we do is host students. They come from uh, sometimes in high school, sometimes as undergraduates or university students. Um, we also host professors and researchers and scientists, experts, folks who come from all over the world to study here at the Marine Science Center, and they are either taking courses or conducting research. So it's a pretty exciting place. And now you are here joining along. So I'd love to remind you that as an audience member, you can use the chat to um, contact us. You can leave comments, you can ask questions in the chat. We'll do our best to answer them as we go along. Um, and I'd like to start off by inviting you to take a moment to just write into the chat where you're joining from. We'd love to hear who is joining us and where you are, where you're coming from today. Um, so while you're typing, I'm going to introduce the rest of my team. There are several people here on the boat that are helping out today. Um, so let's take a look at the other teammates. Over here, we have Heather. Hi, Heather and Owen. They are our, our deckhands today. Um, so they will be operating this fun machine that you see in between them. This is the ROV. We'll have that in the water a little bit later on. More of that to come. Um, back here, we have Phil. And he is managing all of the technology. He's our tech hand for this. Um, so back there in the in the covered area, he's got a couple of laptops and computers set up, and there are there's quite a lot of technology going on in this boat. There's actually one more person here, but I'll introduce her a little bit later on, and we will um, will turn things over to Phil actually temporarily so that he can give you a little bit more of an introduction of where we are on a map. He's going to use Google Earth to show you. All right, thanks, Kelly. Let me get my things in order here. There's a lot of tech to manage back here today. <laughs> okay, so let's bring up Vancouver Island and we shall zoom in a bit. What did I see? Uh, let's see, we have some people from Guelph. And if I just check out the chat a bit more from Calgary, from Edmonton. Um, Cochrane, Alberta, uh, St. Dominic School, Toronto, Ontario, Nova Scotia, Coquitlam, Richmond, people from all over the place, Langley. Um, also, if you are in a classroom, let us know what school and maybe how many people are hanging out with you watching. Um, it'd be great to know how many classrooms are visiting us through, through virtual, through Zoom and, and YouTube today. Okay, so let's just give you a little briefing. So we are on the west side of Vancouver Island. Uh, this is all called Barkley Sound right here. And the village of Banfield is located on the southern portion of Barkley Sound. We're very fortunate that the Science Center uh, has access to the ocean right at our front door right here. So we are on this part right here, uh, very close to right in the middle here is called the, uh, the Broken Group Islands, which is one of three parts of the Pacific Rim National Park Reserve. 
And it is in fact a marine conservation area. Uh, so rockfish are protected within that and there's no fin fishing within the conservation area either. So here we have the Broken Group Islands right there. Um, we'll be talking about other places. I'll bring up another map later on as far as our study sites that we're talking to. And then today we are located, so we have the Science Center right there. And today we took a little boat ride so we came out of the inlet around the corner and we are this whole area here is known as eagle bay uh, locally we call it scotts bay and our boat is pretty much right where the right where the hand is there on on the map um, so as mentioned we are within the traditional territory of the Hawaii first nation and joining us on zoom is mr ed johnson of the Hawaii first nation uh, whose territory we're surveying today thanks ed for joining us uh, we know the oceans continue to provide an important way of life for Hawaiian citizens, even in these modern times. We'd like to welcome you. Uh, and if uh, you could unmute your microphone and share with us a little bit about this place and what it means to celebrate World Oceans Day. Thank you, Bill. Chu Oklama. Uh, I'm talking to you on the traditional territory of the uh, Tishat and Opechusa peoples. Uh, I'm in, uh, currently in uh, Port Alberni. Uh, um, I guess uh, welcoming you virtually to uh, Ohio territory. Um, uh, my, my brother, uh, Kleshan, he's our head, head hereditary chief of Ohio. And uh, it is his, his territory that uh, uh, we're in. And um, uh, World Ocean Day, I think of um, uh, I think of the three uh, sacred principles uh, that uh, us as Wyatt um, follow. Uh, I should mention that uh, we are a treaty, uh, modern day treaty nation since uh, 2011, and uh, you know we mentioned the Broken Group Islands, uh, knowing in, we're all connected uh, through the ocean. Wyatt is uh, one of uh, 14 nations in New Channels, uh, spread out through the whole west coast of uh, Vancouver Island. And that, um, getting back to the three sacred principles uh, that we follow is uh, ESOC is uh, respecting, uh, respecting yourself, uh, respecting uh, others, respecting the land and respecting the oceans. Uh, Wathluck is uh, taken care of translates into taking care of, uh, uh, it's key, you know, we need to take care of the, the lands and the oceans for future generations. And uh, uh, one of the most important uh, principles is uh, Ishuk Masawak, is, um, you know, knowing and understanding that everything is connected and uh, everything is one. And uh, you know, just looking at some of the viewers, you know, all across uh, Canada, you know, it, it's quite exciting to be able to uh, uh, send an RU ROV into the waters, you know, into the depths uh, of the ocean. You know, uh, oh, I had, uh, um, you know, long ago before contact, there was uh, thousands of our people that lived out uh, uh, on the shores, uh, especially in that particular area, you know, and all throughout uh, the Deer Group Islands. And um, there's, a, there's a story that uh, comes to mind. I had no idea what I was going to be uh, uh, saying today, but uh, I feel this story is uh, uh, a great story to, to share. Uh, it, it comes from a book um, called uh, Voices of Our Elders. And there was a very uh, wonderful man that uh, uh, led our people once upon a time. His name was uh, Chief Louis Nukmas, and he talks about these uh, four great spirits. So then uh, I'll talk about the four great spirits. Uh, so then, um, they give shape to all we see and all we are. They are the beginning and the always. They define what we see and together they create the Ohayid world. Uh, these great spirits are land above horizon and the undersea. The great spirit of the land rules over all the oceans and rivers and mountains, lakes, forests, and beaches. 
the tiniest drops of clear dew on the blades of grass, the soft green needles of the fir tree, the rounded pebbles on the beaches are all small parts of this great spirit. Uh, the stars in the night sky, the moon, the sun, and the, the warm light in the summer all come from the great spirit above. As does the wind, the rain, soft in the summer, but cold and lashing in the winter. Rain that falls up the land makes our rivers strong and the oceans powerful. Above controls the clouds and the storms and the healing sun. Now we're on to horizon. Horizon is the doorway for travelers, ever changing as we move on the land. Horizon tells us about what is coming. Look out upon the ocean and see the world's end. Uh, Horizon is a great spirit who controls the boundaries. Uh, when we look over the ocean as far as possible, we see the beginning of Horizon. When the mountains touch the sky and where the land meets the sky, when the eye can see no further, this is horizon. And uh, on to the last uh, great spirit, the great spirit under sea uh, directs the ocean and the uh, tides and its waters. You know, provides uh, food for all creation of the land and the sky animals. Undersea is powerful, as powerful as the waves that dash the shores, that smooth each pebble and rock on the beaches. Undersea is mysterious, for it houses life that can only survive in the water and the darkness deep below. So when I think about uh, my ancestors, you know, and understanding that everything is connected, and you think about horizon, you know, creates those uh, boundaries. And, uh, think about the, um, the teachings that uh, been passed down from generation to generation that's connected to all of those great spirits. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it's nice to be a, a part of this, uh, sharing, you know, uh, the Banfield Brilliant Science Center. I can't say enough about uh, the the involvement that uh, Banfield Brilliant Science Center has in the community and, you know, by, by the looks of everything, you know, across uh, Canada, knowing that uh, um, the five schools that are involved with the Marine Station is, is uh, a true blessing uh, to to create that awareness, awareness of um, uh, how the ocean is doing. I think that that's key, and uh, you know, for our our future, and uh, the the great spirits and our sacred principles, you know, will will lead us in in a good way, and it's uh, it's a great day to be uh, to be a part of and to share a little bit of uh, uh, voices from our elders. But uh, with that, I just like to say, click go, click go, and I hope you enjoy the the, the streaming. Thanks, Ju. Clicko, Clicko to you as well. Ed, thank you so much for joining and sharing that profound message about the ocean. Um, I hope that throughout this broadcast, our viewers will begin to understand, especially those of you who are not um, viewing from an oceanside area, um, the principles of Hishuk Matsawak, as Ed was mentioning, how everything is connected. So many things in the ocean are connected to one another and also to the land, to the sky, to other parts of the living planet. So um, hopefully we can show you a little bit of that as we go along today. 
Okay, there are a few more people to be introduced into our um, webinar today. So I noticed many of our viewers are joining from Calgary today. That's probably because uh, they have an affiliation with the University of Calgary. And this is thanks to um, a new partnership with the University of Calgary's Office of Sustainability. So I'd like to introduce another panelist, Aviva Fialco. If you can uh, unmute and, and start your video here. Aviva is a program coordinator in the U of C's Office of Sustainability, and she was instrumental in getting this webinar going today for, for World Oceans Day. So I'd like to welcome Aviva to our session. Hi, Kelly. Thanks so much for having me here today. And thank you, Ed, for that beautiful passage. That was very moving. I'm so excited to be joining you all today for World Oceans Day. And I would also like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the traditional terriers of the people of the Treaty 7 region of Southern Alberta, which includes the Blackfoot Confederacy, as well as the Tsutana First Nations and the Stony Nakoda. The city of Calgary is also home to the Métis region of Alberta, number three. As one of the founding members of the BMSC, U Calgary is extremely proud of how the BMSC has pivoted this past year, offering more online programs and reaching audiences across the country. Seeing the amazing research and partnerships that you guys have cultivated and how they advance sustainability, we thought World Water Day, or World Oceans Day, sorry, <laughs> would be the perfect opportunity to remind our U Calgary community of our connections to the BMSC and the important relationships we have to celebrating our oceans. Even though you Calgary is far away from the coast, we all have a role to play in supporting the oceans and maintaining the health and wealth of our planet. And events like the one that we're having today are important ways that contribute to advancing the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, especially number 14, Life Below Water, because they raise awareness for the wonders of ocean biodiversity and show how we can all contribute to taking care of our oceans through citizen science initiatives and education. Awesome, thank you. And so we we will um, be able to take you below water a little bit later on. And that's probably why many of our viewers are watching here today um, to gain a better understanding of life below water. So we'll do that. Um, to do that, I'm going to introduce one of the last members of our team on board the boat here today. We have um, Jasmine Schuster. She's joining us here from Memorial University of Newfoundland, and she's a PhD student there. So Jasmine, is studying the dynamics of urchins and kelp and more specifically what happens when kelp is lost in an ecosystem. So this is part of her PhD work at Memorial, but she has another role as well, which is um, the, the program coordinator, coordinator of a thing called Reef Life Survey Canada and also training scuba divers as part of Reef Life Survey Canada. So she's gonna tell us a little bit more about this and, um, and then we'll get underwater. Hello everyone. Um, happy World Ocean Day. I'm super happy to be here today. Thank you Kelly for the introduction and thank you Ed also for sharing this beautiful and important story. Um, I'm super excited to be here and talk a little bit about Reef Life Survey Canada today and uh, let you all dive under the waves with us. So Reef Life Survey Canada is the Canadian branch of a global citizen science network that monitors biodiversity in the ocean um, through scuba, scuba diving based surveys. So Reef Life Survey is an international program that's been running for over 10 years now. It operates in over 50 countries by now. And there's thousands of surveys that are all conducted in exactly the same way. So it creates this really beautiful comparable data set. And um, this program depends on very dedicated volunteers that go out and conduct these surveys um, to basically get data on the status and trends in reef biodiversity. And so in 2018, we launched Reef Life Survey Canada for the first time um, together with Dr. Amanda Bates, who's actually also my PhD supervisor. Um, and we launched the Canadian branch in Newfoundland, where we've been operating for the last three years. And um, uh, yeah, so this year was really exciting. I got very lucky and managed to come to Banfield despite the situation um, globally. And so that was the perfect opportunity for us to expand Reef Life Survey Canada to the West Coast for the first time. Um, and Phil, if you could pull up our, oh, it's already up, perfect. So there's a little map here in the 
uh, orange quadrant on the right side, you can see Newfoundland. So this is where we've mostly been operating for the last three years, conducting surveys, um, mostly on the Avalon Peninsula, which is this bottom right corner of Newfoundland. And so then this year, when I came to Banfield to conduct a little bit of my own research for my PhD, we thought, what a perfect opportunity to bring the program here and launch it on the West Coast, on Vancouver Island. And so in April and May, we actually spent two weeks to conduct uh, scuba-based surveys in Berkeley Sound. And on the map, you can see some of the sites that we've hit here around Bamfield in Berkeley Sound. So there's the Deer Group. That's the first little group of islands around here. We also went a little further to the Broken Group, which was really beautiful. This is most of the sites in here are inside of a rockfish conservation area. And then a little further to the right, we have the Barrier Rock Ecological Reserve, which is a truly magical spot. It's also been an ecological reserve for since the 70s. Um, and there's incredible diversity there. And um, the, this Banfield survey blitz that we ran for those two weeks in April and May was also a great opportunity to train some new people here in Banfield. And so I will hand back over to Kelly who will introduce Siobhan and Em. Wonderful. So maybe you can see right behind me. Oh, you can see right behind me here. There's another boat. And actually, can I get Jasmine Key mute? Thank you. Um, so there's another boat behind me, and we have some scuba divers that are gearing up on the boat to head underwater. Turn around and get a better look at them here. All right. Here is our boat. So on board this boat, we have um, scuba divers Siobhan Gray. She is our dive and safety officer at the Bamfield Marine Sciences Center, and she's in charge of all the diving operations at BMSC. Um, she's also a scientific diver and has been here for many years. The second diver, there they go, woo! <laughs> second diver is M. Lim, who is a grad student at Simon Fraser University, as well as a scientific diver. So they are our dive team today. Normally they would be a team of three and Jasmine would also be in the water with them. But uh, in order to explain her research, we needed Jasmine on the boat here. So there are the, the divers in the water. The next part of our show is very exciting because we are also going to get the ROV into the water so that it can join the divers. And this is the fun part, everybody. We are going to be filming the divers doing their survey underwater. So I'm going to show you what Owen and Heather are up to here. Owen's got the ROV and it is ready to go down into the water there. Very cool. So ROV stands for Remotely Operated Vehicle, and it is controlled by Owen with a, he's got a controller at the surface here. The ROV is tethered to the boat, so it can't actually get lost, but it is swimming away on its own with Owen controlling it. So we're going to send the ROV over to where the divers are and they're gonna to descend together. And maybe I'll turn things back over to Jasmine who can describe what's about to happen here. Thank you, Kelly. Yeah, so we're, Em and, Lim, and uh, Siobhan are gonna do a little demonstration of what a reef life survey typically looks like. Um, so any reef life survey is always based on a standardized area. So. If I can show to the camera here, Kelly, <laughs> um, they have with them a transit tape, which they will lay out in a 50 meter line. And then the divers will swim down this line and basically complete three aspects of the survey. So reef life survey is designed to basically capture the entire ecology of a particular site as best as possible. So there's three aims to each survey. Um, and I will explain them a little more as the divers are in the water so you can really see what they're doing at the time. But right now they're basically getting ready to go down at a selected survey site and they will have with them a transect tape and then they will have with them one of these um, survey slates like such where they will record any species, all the species that they observe um, on the water. And then they also have cameras to take pictures of the species and of the substrate. Great. 
Great, and you are now able to see the ROV feed as well. It's caught up with the divers. It looks like the visibility in the water is not great today, but that's okay. That is pretty typical for this time of year. It is springtime. There's lots of plankton in the water and it looks like the divers are ready to descend from the surface. They are headed underwater. There they go. They just disappeared from the surface. They are underwater here. So the ROV is gonna tag along and we're going to be seeing what the divers are up to once we get a little bit closer. You can see the divers are carrying their slates with the, the data sheet, the survey sheet with them. They have some other things attached to them as well. There's a camera. All right. And so once they get down, they're going to look for a good area to start the transit survey. So we're always looking for a rocky substrate because we're really focusing on rocky reefs. Um, and then they're looking for an, a site where you can reel out a transit tape for 50 meters. On this little demonstration we're doing today, we're, we're minimizing it a little bit to 10 meters, um, just so the RV can easily follow and show what they're doing. But I think they've already started reeling out from what I can see on my screen. Um, so they will select a compass bearing that follows in a direction that runs parallel to the shore. And then the first diver will reel out the transit tape while a second diver will closely follow behind and they will take pictures of the substrate a little bit above the ground. And these photos are really useful to later quantify, for example, um, what the habitat uh, cover is, for example, what the algae cover is, or uh, identify different sessile species. Um, yeah. Jasmine, would you be able to tell us what um, what a transect is, just in case some of our video our viewers might not be sure? Sure. So a transect is. Basically, it's just a standardized area that you're surveying. So in this case here, they're reeling out the tape to fix a length. And then we are actually using blocks to each side of this tape. So in a reef life survey, they will measure fishes to five meters to each side of this tape. And basically each diver will, the, the blocks will be split between the two divers. So we will have one diver on the left and one diver on the right and they will swim up and down it to complete the different aspects of a survey. And uh, there's obviously different ways that you can design a biodiversity survey. Um, another option would be to measure something per unit time. So instead of defining a certain area to count and measure things in, you will just spend a certain amount of time watching what passes by. So there we can see them go. <laughs> so. We'll see if we can see any fish, but once they've reeled out, they will be getting ready to start the first part of the survey, which is uh, really focused on anything that's pelagic, so in the water column, and that includes any fish really, um, but also in areas like around here, sometimes we'll see sea lions or the seals around, um, jellyfish, anything like that will count during this part of the survey. And I think if I can see correctly, they are finished with reeling out now. So they are just communicating with each other, making sure everyone is okay and uh, splitting up who's gonna be on which side of the transect. And then, yeah, there they go, getting their slates ready. It's obviously a bit of a challenge, challenge sometimes to write on the water, um, but practice, practice helps. Um, yeah, there's some kelp there. I want to uh, just remind our viewers, you can ask questions at any time using the comments or the chat, so go for it. And so 
I'm really happy that we did most of our surveys in April and May before all the summer blooms really kicked off because visibility right now really is not the dream. Um, we're really looking to have at least two meters visibility for these surveys so we can really see the fishes that are coming through. So you can see, I think that's Siobhan, um, writing down fishes that they're observing. So when we do a fish survey, we will identify any species that we see, we will count how many there are, and we will also size them. So the, the survey slates, I can show this again, on the side, you can actually see these little the black slashes, and those are 10 centimeter size increments, so that you're able to um, have a little bit of help when you're trying to estimate the size of a fish. There are a few questions. Um, so I haven't seen any. <laughs> no turtles. What is the water temperature? The last time I was in the water, it was 10 degrees at the bottom. So this is really dry suit territory. I was a little optimistic when I came here bringing, bringing my wetsuit. And uh, I, tried, I tried doing a survey once, but uh, doing a complete survey takes, takes, a little, takes a while, especially in an area like here where it's actually super diverse and there's lots of animals to, to count. Um, we often spend an entire hour for a survey. And so dry suit is the way to go. <laughs> Bill, there was one more question that we missed. Um, yeah, so I guess uh, we talked about sea turtles, best time of year for visibility, uh, water temperature, but I have a couple from over from YouTube um, asking, are we going to see any sea seals or sea lions? Uh, and also uh, another question, do, you, uh, do we do a plankton drag as well to know what kinds of zoo and phytoplankton is in the area? So Sea lions, always possible. Who knows? There could be some around. We actually did see a seal bobbing around uh, before we started this broadcast. So maybe it's still in the area and we'll come back. Um, and in terms of plankton, um, that's not part of the, the Reef Life Survey Protocol, but there's certainly um, some monitoring programs, I believe, that, that do different methods of capturing plankton um, using tow nets, things like that. So if I can see correctly, the, they are now moving on to the second part of the survey, which is focused on invertebrates and really anything that's close to the bottom. So during the fish survey, the diver is sort of high up in the water column, um, moving at a relatively fast speed, but now they're really honing in on the, on the bottom. And so they will only look in a one meter area to each side of the transect tape and again count um, and identify all species of invertebrates as well as cryptic fish. Um, so cryptic fish are little fish that will hide a little bit more that you don't find in the water column um, and that are often very well camouflaged. So you really need to get up close, um, have a good light ideally, and then you can find those during the second part of the survey. Yeah. Um, so one of the questions was, what are the orange things? And um, those are a type of sea cucumber. What you're seeing are the orange feeding tentacles of the sea cucumber. Most of the animal's body is actually buried in the sediment or into the rocks. Um, so you can't actually see the whole cucumber, but their feeding tentacles are extended and they are feeding on all that plankton that is floating around in the water column right now. Um, so that was one of the questions that was asked, and now I've forgotten the other one. Bill, can you help me out with the other question? That oh, I remember. It was, um, do we collect garbage while we're doing the surveys? If you find them, I'm going to turn that back to Jasmine to answer that question. That's a great question. Um, so as we do our invertebrate surveys, we will actually also record any debris or trash that we see, and we will record what type. So is it metal? Is it fishing gear? Is it glass, etc. Um, and uh, yeah, then we will remove it if we have some bags available to stuff it in, we will take it out. And so right now they're looking for invertebrates. This part of the survey is much slower. You'll actually spend some time if there's kelp 
sort of waving through the kelp with your hands and really looking in detail for anything that you see. I have a, a question from a YouTube viewer, um, Andrew Newson asking, why is it called a reef? I thought reefs had coral. Are there any coral in the area? Yeah, so reef actually is also referred to rocky, is also used to refer to rocky reefs. Um, I'm not sure about the why. <laughs> I don't know. So there, but to answer, there's no coral here. Um, corals are typically more tropical areas and we're here, in, here we are in a temperate system. Um, so functionally speaking, we, we get kelp here, which kind of uh, fulfills some similar roles in that it's really important in providing habitat for uh, juvenile fish, um, it's a source of food for many, many species, of course. And um, yeah, so. It's a little hard um, to point out some of the cool species we see here, unfortunately, right now. But um, this, this side here, Eagle Bay, is actually incredibly diverse. Um, we found, I found one of my favorite observations here, which is a grunt sculpin. Um, and it was the only one I saw on all our surveys. And grunt sculpins are only about this big um, and they will actually hide inside um, empty giant barnacle shells. And they have these beautiful uh, orangey red pectoral fins, which they will sometimes wave out of the barnacle shell to make it look like they are a binacle barnacle um super clever and they're really adorable they actually don't really swim they just hop over the ground super cute so i was very excited when i saw a ground sculpin but um i'm sure am and siobhan are counting many urchins right now and probably also many sea cucumbers um, these are some of the species that are very abundant here and so are the bat stars there's a question uh how deep are the divers underwater Maybe Owen can answer that question for me. Owen says they're only about three and a little bit meters underwater right now. They're pretty shallow. Yeah, we kept it a little closer today for to have the RV with the divers, but most of our surveys are really between five and 10 meters. <laughs> We limit to 10 meters maximum um, because the time you can spend at depth decreases as you go deeper, because we're obviously dependent on a scuba tank. Um, and so 10 meters is sort of a safe, safe limit to have enough air to complete a survey in a, in a safe manner. And so every diver will always be equipped with a camera. Um, I think we might have, or at least I might have missed that at, at the start, um, that one of the divers would have gone down to transect and taken pictures of the substrate. But it's also really useful to have a camera in case you see a species that you don't, that you're not really sure about, which will sometimes happen. You know, if something is particularly rare and unique, um, then it's really helpful to take lots of pictures and different angles, and that can help us to identify later. So every survey is always followed by uh, some time processing the data after, where we will all sit together and compare our data sheets, making sure that we've identified the species correctly um, and all agree on, on what was done and the specifics of the survey, which depth we were at, et cetera. Et cetera. Um, so we'll sit, sit around with a stack of species identification guides and have some fun with that. Okay, there are a bunch of questions coming through. Um, yeah, I see a whole bunch of questions here. Um, let's go with, uh, let's see. Oh, oh, there's more coming in. I need to scroll up a bit. Can I answer yours in the meantime, Kelly? Sure. Did you say what type of fish? Yeah, what type of fish are common here? So some of the fish that we will see on pretty much any survey are the kelp greenlings. 
um, they're almost entirely at this entire, almost certainly at the site right now. There's also various species of rockfish that are really beautiful. Many of them form large schools that will uh, hang out in the water column. And sometimes they get a little scared when you come in, but many, many species are actually quite territorial. So they will quickly come back and hang around you um, once they're used to you being there. So many rockfish species, the China rockfish is particularly beautiful. It's really gorgeous. It has this yellow band down its body and some yellow fins, uh, fin rays. There's also copper rockfish and black rockfish. Um, various species of sculpin, which are also really cool. The ground sculpin is one that I've mentioned. That's a really small species, but there's also red Irish lords, which can get pretty large. Um, what about Yes, Wolfiel. I've only seen one and uh, I was extremely excited. We get them in Newfoundland too and I've never managed to see one. So I was, I was super excited when I saw one here. That was actually at Barrier Rocks at the Ecological Reserve. And they're very grumpy looking. They have big teeth. <laughs> A little bit scary. Um, but yeah, wolfish are here. Great. Phil, do you want to jump in with some of the other questions? Sure. Um... Oh, here's one. Uh, you're being asked, uh, Jasmine, from your perspective, what are some of the main differences between the surveys you have conducted on the East Coast versus the West? Great question. I feel super lucky that I've had the chance to dive into both the most eastern, easternmost part of Canada and the westernmost part. Um, it's a really cool uh, opportunity. And so in Newfoundland, it's really an urgent dominated system. It's like the urgent world order over there. So most of our surveys are actually sort of urgent counting exercises. We have the green sea urgent over there and often we will count 4,000 on a single survey. So that's in a 500 meter square area, <laughs> several thousands of these urchins, which uh, can be a little daunting at first, but also kind of fun. Um, but there's also many other species in Newfoundland. But what really struck me as soon as I went in the water here in Banfield is that it's incredibly diverse. It's a super productive system here. So many beautiful species. So pretty much any survey that we've completed here has about double the diversity in species, I would say. And that's both for the inwards and the fish. And I've also noticed that everything is huge here. <laughs> um, yeah, all the, all the organisms are just double in size. Um, so yeah, really, really cool to see. There's a question about um, how do the divers write underwater? Are you are using a special pen or pencil? Um, any pencil will work actually, but it can be a challenge to find one that works well over time. Um, we've tried with clicky pencils, but if you have any metal parts, they will start rusting and breaking apart and you don't want that. Um, but yeah, you can also have like a graphite pen that works well. Yeah, any, any pencil works. Okay, and also, um, uh, is this area well known for urchins? Just wondered if any findings so far indicate healthy amounts slash depletion. Yeah, so there's actually lots of urchins here too. Um, and there's three species that are found here. So the green sea urchin is actually around this area as well. Although I will say I haven't seen any. Uh, that's not true. I've seen two tiny, tiny baby green sea urchins. Um, but the dominant species here is the red sea urchin. And we also have purple sea urchins um, that have, I'd say relatively healthy populations. The red sea urchins, um, are quite abundant, perhaps overly abundant. So you can really see in, in many areas that the kelp is sort of restricted to very shallow areas now, um, which the red urchins don't really like so much because it's a little more wave exposed. Um, and then it will almost, there will almost be a, a distinct line where the kelp just ends and then it's all urchins. So yes, that's a, it's a strong population here too. But uh, the red sea urchins are pretty massive. They can get sort of the size of a head, um, which means the biomass is huge, but in terms of counts, it's actually a little more manageable from a survey perspective. <laughs> Thank you.
Yeah, so after they've gone down the transect once more to count all the invertebrates, then the survey is pretty much complete and they will re reel back in the tape and that's it. And so this would be a great time then for the ROV to do some exploring and also um, another great time for you guys to keep on asking questions. I love all the questions that are coming in, but let's take a look around with the ROV and see what else is down here. Maybe we can get some nice close-ups of some invertebrate species or maybe even some fish, who knows? Let's see. This is always one of our favorite dive sites. There's an urchin. We were just talking about urchins. So now we have an urchin on the screen, as well as a California sea cucumber and a bat star all at once, all side by side there together. So this is really exciting. Like, like we were saying, that the, the diversity here at this site is really great. And this is really a perfect frame because I would say those are the three most abundant invertebrates that we will count on our service here. So that was a cool shot. There's the orange sea cucumbers again. So we ask Already a we have two question from YouTube. Uh, from YouTube, uh, I guess a question for Jasmine is what training do you need to become a scientific diver? So to become a scientific diver in Canada, there's um, what is called the Canadian Association of Underwater Science, I believe, HOUSE. Um, and that's sort of the standardized protocol to be a scientific diver that really any university will utilize to um, have diving programs. And um, you need a certain number of dives to be able to be certified. Um, and there's also some other sort of hoops to jump through in terms of having a dive medical um, and you need to see your first aid training and your oxygen provision training. Um, so there's a couple of steps you'll need to take to become certified for that. Um, and it will work in different countries. Um, and then there's a standardized training for 35 service specifically that, yeah, with Memorial University as well, with through BMSC, you will need this house certification to be able to participate in that. Uh, there's another question. What are your opinions on urchin harvesting? Are they good eating? Oh, and I can see a fish on there. Oh, there's a black at Gobi. You can see it's very black eyes and then it has a black fit spot on the dorsal fin. So that's how we know. But uh, <laughs> sidetrack to answer your question. Um, urchin harvesting. Well, I think they're delicious. I do occasionally pick up some urchins and I've so far tried green urchins in Newfoundland and red urchins here. And a friend described them as sea butter. I think that's very accurate. <laughs> they're very tasty. And um, I do think that urchin harvesting is a viable um, approach to manage the population. So how my PhD program I project actually evolved was going to this one region in Newfoundland where there is some urchin harvesting and because previously I'd only dive in, in regions that are totally urchin dominated it was the first time that I saw it here and that's not and that really struck me and stuck with me and that's how um, my research kind of kicked off that I want to focus on this dynamic because the differences were so striking as they help me recover. Um, yeah, there's, there's definitely lots of research going into urchin harvesting and how we can sort of maximize, like if you want to harvest them for profit, how you can maximize the feasibility of that. Um, so trying to figure out under what conditions the urchin role will be of the highest quality, I guess. Um, yeah. Any other questions, Phil, coming in on um, YouTube? We ha we're winding down, actually. We just have a few minutes left on in our, our lesson here today. So get your questions in while you can. Right, we're just saw an abalone. Ooh, abalone, nice. Um, we're having a question about uh, what type of paper are they using underwater? And then uh, also the question of, do sea cucumbers move around?
Yes, yeah, so the sea cucumbers, there's a kelp greenling, <laughs> not a fish sidetrack. I think that was a female kelp greenling there. Um, and yeah, the sea cucumbers can move around. I'm not sure how fast they are really, um, but they do move. And uh, what was our other question? The paper, yes, thank you. So this is some um, special, what, I'm not sure what the official name or term is, but I guess waterproof paper, it's got this plasticky coating, which also means it won't tear, which is really helpful. There was also a question about our abalone endangered, and the answer to that is yes, that is an endangered species. Um, we are very fortunate to have quite a few abalone here around Bamfield because um, years ago, as part of the Bamfield Marine Sciences Center, we had a hatchery for abalone where we were raising them in the lab and then releasing them back into the wild. It was pretty successful. And so as we are diving around Bamfield, we often do see abalone, but they are um, still an endangered species in other parts of the world. And yes, you would be fined if you were caught harvesting abalone. There's a pretty substantial fine for that one. Right now we are looking at a, I believe that's a red rock crab. Am I right, Owen? Yeah red rock crab. So there's another invertebrate species for you um, to add to our list, our diversity list today. We've got quite a lot of a lot of animal diversity. And that's one of the beautiful things about this area of the world. Barkley Sound is so diverse. Probably some of that is due to our proximity to uh, Pacific Rim National Park Reserve, which is the protected area nearby. And um, it allows us to have so many species that uh, have a, a appropriate area to reproduce and expand their populations. Um, there's a beautiful kelp greenling right there, but you're seeing that as a female kelp greenling. Hey, does anyone know, uh, Kelly or Jasmine, how much oxygen would be in the diver's tanks? Or how much air? So, um, yeah, so a full scuba tank will have about 250 bars or 3000 PSI, which are the units to measure how much air you have in your tank. Um, and let's say at, at 10 meters, that will give you over an hour of time in the water. You can probably do an hour 15 if necessary, but it all depends on how, how you're breathing is, of course. And because we're doing a survey, which means you're constantly moving um, and you're concentrating on many things, you often go through your air a little bit quicker than if you're just sort of having fun in the water. Yeah, now what about, um, what about sea otters? Someone's asking, are sea otters this far south? Uh, or uh, where we are, um, this person has seen, uh, they've heard of very occasional sea otters close to Victoria at the farthest south, uh, but he, I guess the farthest south they've seen them is over by Cayucut. Yeah, so we have um, the occasional sea otter here in Bamfield, but we don't have a full-time population of sea otters in our area. They uh, Usually we just see one at a time, which indicates it's probably a lone male who's sort of expanding his territory, looking for somewhere new to, to inhabit. Um, but we don't have rafts of large families or females or young sea otters yet. Although since we've um, eliminated hunting of sea otters, they are starting to return to our coast and they are moving into new waters. So that's great. Um, right now, I think we're still looking at a, a female kelp greenling, but there was a shot a little bit earlier of a male kelp greenling. And those are the fish that the males and females look like completely different species. And that's really exciting. Um, it takes a while to get to learn the, the different species. Cool find, Owen, with the ROV. Okay, I think it is time for us to wrap up our lesson here today. Um, we're getting a lot of great comments and thank yous from our viewers who have been enjoying the ROV feed underwater. I would like to say a big thank you to all of our participants who were joining this lesson, um, Aviva from Calgary, uh, Ed Johnson from the Huayat First Nation, our team of divers underwater for conducting the survey, Heather and Owen on the boat here for doing the, um, for managing the ROV. We also have Jasmine, thank you so much for sharing your life, your Reef Life Survey Canada work with us. And Phil on board as well. Thank you, Thanks, everyone. everyone.